you very much, uh, Marta. Hello and welcome to the side event organized in the framework of the 11th International Conference on Sustainable Development, the ICSD. Uh, indeed, my name is Maria Cortez Puch and I am Vice President at SDSN, where I lead the networks program. We are delighted to be hosting this webinar on transformative solutions for achieving gender equality with our partner, GIZ, and with the support of the German Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ. Today, we will present several examples of successfully implemented solutions to help advance SDG 5 at the local or regional level. These solutions have been selected amongst SDSN member institutions. And also we've invited one of our newest members uh, from Ukraine to join us as a guest speaker. Thank you to the SDSN uh, team and very specifically to Marta Garcia Aro, who has greatly led this project to fruition and to our network managers in Africa, America and the Black Sea region for their support in identifying and selecting these wonderful solutions. Before we listen to them, let me introduce you to Marta Getacheu Bekele who will be framing our session with some opening remarks. Marta is the Delivery Quality and Impact Lead at the VINIT, where she leads a team of researchers who are working on development themes, including poverty, disaster risk, resilience, climate change, and public expenditure among many, many other topics. Uh, Marta has extensive work experience in the development sphere in East Africa, and she is a very valued collaborator of SDSN, uh, who join us periodically to help us think through some of our uh, work. So we're very grateful for you to be here once again. Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria, and thank you to the and SDSN for the opportunity to deliver opening remarks in this ICSD special session on transformative solutions for achieving gender equality. We're here to, to hear uh, from experts around the world as they present how they are implementing local solutions that are advancing the SDGs in their country's context. And I hope we all agree that gender equality is a fundamental human right. Every individual, regardless of the, their gender, deserves equal opportunities. Opportunities, but also rights and protections. Gender equality ensures that everyone has access to education, access to healthcare, employment and decision-making processes without discrimination or bias. Gender equality is also closely linked to sustainable development. That's why we are here. Empowering women and girls has a multiplier effect on social progress and economic growth. When women have equal access to education, to resources and opportunities, they, they can contribute fully to their community's development, leading to improved health, reduced poverty, and enhanced overall well-being. Today, in this session, we will hear about Black women researchers in oceanography in South Africa, building more inclusive development in the tourism industry in Bolivia, empowering women to cope with the effects of climate change in Mali, empowerment and mental uh, women in the Sahel region of Africa, and women empowerment in science from Ukraine. All these presentations are about local solutions based on local research by local actors. A common thread in all this is the crucial role of data. And that's what I want to focus on today. For example, it is impossible to understand the interaction between economic and climate actions with a strong feminist focus without comprehensive sustainable gender data. There is a need for stronger data ecosystems that include and recognize gender. Less than half of the data needed to measure progress against SDG 5 is available, less than half. And women and girls face barriers to inclusion in even the most fundamental data col um, collected through what we call CRBs or civil registration and vital statistics. This missing data can negatively impact countless outcomes, livelihoods and well-being, including access to basic services. Again, to emphasize 
reliable, timely, well disaggregated and inclusive data can tell us the intersectionality of gender with poverty, intersectionality of gender with geography, intersectionality of gender with race and ethnicity, intersectionality of gender with disability and so on. We need to identify and work against factors of inclusion, exclusion, sorry, and for that we need data. Without data, there is no research. Without data, there is no effective program. Without meaningful, timely, relevant, and disaggregated data, it is impossible to carry out development planning and monitoring. Another issue that I want to raise in this opening remark is to highlight the localization aspect of data collection and analysis. Local solution based on research. That's why we are here. But whose research is it anyway? It does matter. It does matter who carries out the research as we use them for planning, programming, and policies. This is crucial for local researchers who are often left out at some point in the data value chain. Studies show local researchers in remote areas or even in major towns in less developed countries are often brought in once the research design is finalized. Locals are relegated to primary data collection before being removed from the data analysis and write-up, which is carried out by international organizations and experts. Imagine now how difficult and complex it is for women local researchers. In short, for any transformative action for achieving gender equality within the actionable research ec ecosystem, be it in climate change, empowering women in the tourism industry, empowering and mentoring women and girls in the labor market, there is need to strengthen data systems that tell us where exactly the challenges are, the root causes of those challenges, such as inequalities, and factors contributing to exclusion. We need to invest in gender responsive and inclusive data ecosystems that are vital to tackle current national and global challenges, ensuring inclusive responses and recovery to crisis, understanding policy outcomes, as well as allowing resources to be better targeted and to deliver better intersectional gender quality outcomes. So to conclude, I want to emphasize once again, it matters who does the research. We need to enable our women local researchers to be able to collect their own data, carry out analysis, interpret their findings in a manner that makes a difference in achieving gender equality. Thank you very much. Maria, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Marta. What insightful questions you've launched uh, to the panelists. So the importance of data, of course, but not just of any data. Who is collecting that data? Who is conducting the research? And who is analyzing the data and the results of the research? Um, so as you all uh, know, SDSN has 1,900 academic member institutions that are organized in 55 national and regional networks covering 140 countries. So precisely we're trying to have these uh, diverse and, and regional reach uh, across the world. And this vast network together with some of our partners are contributing to the progress of SDG5 with very innovative uh, solutions that we are very delighted to, to give visibility to today. Uh, in particular, today, we're going to be listening uh, about solutions that come from our networks in the Sahel, in South Africa, the Black Sea, Mali, and Bolivia. And let me introduce you to one of our first speakers, uh, Kati Altieri, if you could perhaps uh, open your camera. She's going to be uh, presenting the initiative called Ocean Womax. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in the Oceanography Department at the University of Cape Town and has received several awards, including the UCT College of Fellows Young Research Award only last year. Katia, over to you. Thank you so much. I will share my screen quickly. And... Excellent. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. 
Today, I'll be presenting on ocean women, seeing a change in the demographics of oceanographic research in South Africa. This was a program developed in response to a call by our new vice chancellor of the university, Professor Mamakheti Pakeng. And this was a specific proposal call targeted towards women and transgender researchers at the University of Cape Town. We had to focus on training postgraduates and postdoctoral fellows and emphasized building capacity amongst black South African women. Now we responded to this by developing the Ocean Women Program. The aim of our program was to develop a prestigious research and leadership training program for black women that focused on recruiting, retaining and enabling success for the next generation of black women oceanographers. You see here below a snapshot of our website um, with our tagline here, supporting a new generation of black oceanographers. And we really wanted to focus on the fact that this was not a remedial program in any way, shape or form. This was a program aimed to develop the next generation of oceanographers, which is a field of research in South Africa that's very, very highly regarded due to our unique location between the South Atlantic, the South Indian, and adjacent to the Southern Ocean. The objectives of our program were threefold. The first was to identify and overcome barriers to recruitment, retention, and success. The second was to create an environment that enabled Black women to succeed in their postgraduate degrees and to eventually become leaders in the field, both nationally and internationally. The third was to develop and evaluate our training program so that it could be applied more generally to other marine science programs in South Africa. And what we've discovered is actually it's really universally broadly applicable to other universities and training environments around the world. I wanna spend a moment to talk through the, a few of the barriers we identified. The first was financial barriers, and this included things such as from the very beginning of a student being accepted into the university that we had to provide relocation expenses. We provided additional years of stipend for the fellows so that financial pressures for their degree was not a concern. We paid to, for tuition and fees for the students. We gave them whatever computing resources they needed, and we provided travel funds to support their development, whether that be through summer schools or other training programs around the continent or in Europe or beyond. The second set of barriers we identified were professional. And this is related to issues around networking. So our department at the time had zero black women oceanographers at the University of Cape Town. And so of course we were not capable of providing the networking and mentoring that our fellows needed. And so we set up opportunities for our fellows to network with other black female scientists from further abroad in the continent. We also provided additional training opportunities for the women, opportunities for them to shadow us, um, the PIs of the program as we represented South Africa internationally. And orientation was a key component of when fellows and students were brought in, making sure they were properly oriented to their degree, to the university and to what the expectations were of them. The third set of barriers we identified were in the personal category. This included the importance of mentoring, building the students, the fellows together as a cohort so they could rely on one another, providing also things that many take for granted, a passport, the funding to get a passport, the appropriate field gear for doing work in oceanography, and things such as swimming lessons or scuba diving certification or a skipper's certification, things that make one feel that they belong to the culture of oceanography. We also focused on creating an environment for success. We brought in professionals, a consultant team that specializes in diversity and transformation to help us identify what were the issues in our department and university and how could we make sure that this was a space where black women could thrive. The results of this initiative highlighted that you really need to have a serious intent to transform and identify and confront uncomfortable issues. Lastly, I wanna focus on some of the key lessons learned in this program. The first is the importance of financial investment. If you're gonna seriously take charge of something as large as trying to increase diversity, reduce barriers to success, and really foster an environment and change the environment, you have to financially invest in the program. We also found that it was very important that this program was initiated from the vice chancellor at the very top of the university, highlighting how important the issue was and also providing um, important credibility to the program. We found co-production was a really important component. We had to let the fellows play a role. As I mentioned, you need uncomfortable conversations and you need to really focus on where your sphere of influence is. What can you as white staff members do to make black South African women feel more comfortable? 
With that, I want to close and highlight that the success of this program really comes from the Ocean Women Fellows themselves. Here you can see a photo of our first cohort of six women with our Vice Chancellor of the University in the middle, the woman who initiated the program. And all the success of Ocean Women comes from the fact that these fellows are absolutely outstanding. I encourage you to join us on social media and learn more about the program. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to share our work. Thank you very much. What a what a wonderful solution. Um, I think we're going to move to our next presenters, but there will be time for question and answers later. Uh, make sure to use the chat function, and I'm going to give the floor to our ne next speaker, Andres Aramayo, um, who is the director of Orbita, the Bolivian Observatory for Sustainable uh, Tourism Industry. Um, this is precisely the initiative that we will be listening to. Andres uh, has worked in tourism as a public official in the municipality of Bolivia's capital, La Paz, and as a director at the Vice Ministry of Tourism in Bolivia. And throughout he, his career, he has led several uh, tourism technology and innovation initiatives. Andres, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning everyone. So I'm going to present you our initiative that it's named Orbita. Uh, this is financed by the IDRC, by the way, and implemented by the SDSM Bolivia and Fundacion ES. Uh, I'm going to make you just a quick review of what, what are you going to see here. You're going to see a collection of photos, because if we're going to talk about tourism, I want to try to show you Bolivia, my magical country. And we're going to start this, this road, uh, giving you some idea of what Bolivia is. Bolivia is in the heart of South America. As you can see here in the map, it looks like a small country, but for you to make just an idea of the size of Bolivia, uh, it's three times bigger than Ukraine, and Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe. So it's a really big country for the size population that we have. Moreover, most of the time, people tend to think that Bolivia is an Andean country, and that is not, not totally true. As you can see, Bolivia, with the forest areas that makes that 3.5% of the planet's forest in home between 45 and 55% in world's biodiversity, within over 3,000 species of mammals, reptiles, fishes, amphibians, and more than uh, 1,400 birds. That is extremely impressive. It's an economy based on gas production, gold, and zinc. And in the fourth place is tourism. I'm gonna go deeper uh, among why I'm the trying to explain you how we are trying to achieve the, the GDS-5. <clears throat> and as you can see, this is la like the picture of the people who is trying to make a certain economic impact or try to improve their economic and financial situations, trying to empower women. Nine out of 10 <clears throat> jobs depends on informal economy, that it's low quality jobs, dependence of international prices, and that model is untainable. Uh, about the population labor in Bolivia, you have the following data. Um, in Bolivia, we are around 12 million population size. Um, our last census has been released uh, 13 years ago. Uh, the 50.5% is in working age, and only the 5%, 3,100, 3, are employees generated by tourism. And from that number, 75%, around 75, 72, depending on the year that you take, uh, these employees have been taken by women. So in Orbita, uh, we established the following idea, uh, and is uh, through academic research, all the information that we can um, disseminate or we can share, not only with, with the touristic sector, but also with government, also with other areas of the economic um, impact, in, in, we, we could send the idea that we cannot stay depending on natural resources based economy. Moreover, uh, information is not magical. We need to teach to the, to the companies, to the corporates, how to use <laughs> information to improve um, and, and, and to improve and increase competitiveness uh, with all this tourism change, global change that is extremely competitive and digital. Moreover, we have been working with around 17 universities all around Bolivia financing thesis, specifically for tourism, gender equality, and economic development. 
And finally, we establish the observatory to continue keep uh, providing data for all Bolivia, not focused in tourism, but um, we have actually a working paper that established that tourism in Bolivia impacts in the 17 SDGs in, in, in all over Bolivia. So all the municipalities that have been working with tourism, they have better performance in 17 SDGs, uh, not only one, two or three, but 17. So just to give you a quick idea, tourism sector have been growth uh, during the last 13 years uh, before pandemic and 10% average. And our GDP has been growing 3.5, 3.3. So tourism has been growing three times, maybe four times. Um, moreover, um, tourism is the fourth currency attractor, but it's not true because it's the first because of exportation of services. Bolivia depends on natural resources and commodities. So when you start to see that Bolivia could bring uh, fresh currency, a foreign currency, it is something that is extremely important because the money of the future, we could have it now. The third indicator is the fifth formal, uh, formal job generator. As I told you before, uh, we, we are 90% informal and, and low quality jobs. So this is a really great indicator. And the 75% of employees have been occupied by women. Um, during pandemic, 65% of the jobs have been disappeared. And that is around 100,000 uh, formal employments. That is a really critic, uh, critic situation because this crisis is not overwhelmed yet. Moreover, I wanna show you, most of the time people tell me, but in tourism, there is just a few people working over there. And I want to show you that here we have more people working in tourism than in the mining sector. And something that I wanna contrast with you is the national minimum wage. As you can see, around uh, the 35% the of people have been working in Bolivia in uh, uh, agroeconomic. It's around the half or maybe one fourth of the national minimum wage. And it, that is uh, most of the time with some consequences or some external factors that we cannot control, international prices, open markets, maybe rainy season and many other things. So here in tourism, as you can see, there are more women working than in mining sector and with better conditions than in agropecuarian sector. And more important than that is that women not only uh, can encounter opportunities over there, but they create. Women create opportunities, they lead companies, they lead associations, they lead uh, corporations, and they are the ones who are leading tourism in Bolivia with non-support of, of, of the government. This is an analysis of three decades where you can see that women in three decades are creating and generating businesses to improve the, the tourism ecosystem and to generate jobs. <clears throat> so now this is kind of uh, common in, in some countries and it's easy to see. But now I wanna show you something that we have been working in communitarian tourism <clears throat> that doesn't uh, reflect the previous data. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the key factors of tourism to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls in the private formal sector is the low entry barriers to get connected with global providers. Most of the time, if you are able to read and to speak to two languages, you could have six months or three months of training and you can be part of, 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 this, um, of this industry. The entry level jobs are, uh, jobs are considered an extension of home economy and women have more competitive advantage than men in service-based economies. So moreover, Key factors for rural, rural or countryside and communitarian, communitarian tourism, women are not natural decision makers. Most of the time they are just living over there with less opportunities than men. Most of the rural territories depends on low, on low quality jobs, men support their agricultural business. And third, economy of survival where men most of the time are trading goods on cities or urban environments. I want to show you two interventions that we have been establishing here in Bolivia. One is in Luribay, and the other one is in Astucupecha, as you can see, pretty, pretty places. And this is something of the fundings that we have released in, in our work. First of all, we identified three levels of development. When they only have the idea and the initial development, they don't have governance. When they are in intermediate development, they could create an offer, a touristic offer. They must establish a governance 
But most of the time, because they don't have formation in tourism, they have a lack of knowledge of operation. And where we're trying to develop them is develop the offer, establish the governance, and make them possible to operate. Um, just in, in, in these in this final slides, I want to show you what is the change of when, when we establish a community tourism in these communities. First of all, women complete their studies in elementary and high school. Just a few achieve technical and, and possibly bachelor's degree. That is something extremely, extremely good. Increase the financial resources that support the home economy, children's studies, and other expenses. And they become decision makers and have influence among the community. And I want to share with you these six lines of operative lines. Andres, that we have in yes, uh, uh, just one more minute, please. Yeah, this is this is the last slide. Thank you. So Excellent. This, 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 we start with collective actions. We start uh, in the second instance, we institutionalize and create governance. Then we develop the idea, uh, sharing with all the community. In, in the fourth place, <laughs> we establish touristic potential and possible benefits. And finally, um, we establish integration to touristic attractions with their um, cultural resources. And finally, we start to think in income generation. This is one of the most common mistakes. People start to think that we have start with income generation, but if you want to try to work in tourism, you have to do these previous steps. So that's all. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you so much, Andres. And I think you've made very a very clear point of what Marta was saying at the beginning of the of the need of data. No, with this graph where you show the importance of the mining and the tourism sectors compared to each other. When in mining, of course, it's a mostly men led jobs, and in tourism, seventy five percent of them are women uh, are held by women. Let's move to our next solution and we'll have time to discuss all of these things further in, in a bit. Dr. Aisa Tu Sisoko, uh, if you could turn on your camera, she's a senior manager at Wimena, Women Mentoring and Employment Network in Africa, an initiative by the Association of Women Leadership and Development in Africa. She was worked as a consultant for several international organizations, such as the African Development Bank, as well as the Mark Mastercard Foundation and the German International Cooperation, GIZ, where she has developed uh, sustainable solutions for the protection of the environment and sustainable development in Africa. I said to over to you. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I will share um, my screen quickly. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, thank you. Um, I will um share the presentation of Women Now, which is a women mentoring and empowerment network in Africa. Our main objectives in Women Now are the uh, to mentor ten thousand of women and girls in the journey of social economic transformation by end of two thousand twenty five. We also want to empower uh. 1,000 sublit girls or women in rural areas with access to digital skills and vocational training. And empower and mentor 1,000 women and girls through an entrepreneurship incubator to create their own businesses. So, uh, uh, here in this slide, I will talk about our solution to promote gender equality. Um, in Women Now, we educate, empower, mentor women, girls on societal issues impacting their life. We use the power of digital to empower women, girls to have access to information technologies uh, and sensitize on child marriage and all forms of discrimination and sexual harassment through culturally acceptable mentoring. Because in Africa, uh, cultural aspects are very important. So 
So, and in women, uh, we promote to education to be gender sensitive through mentoring and empowerment. We raise in our organization aspiration of women and girls and their parents through mentoring and empowerment. Empower women, girls for social economic uh, development. So, um, how can uh, our organization improve gender equality in the community? We empower communities to end all forms of discrimination against women and girls. We support events that highlight or celebrate women's achievement, and we engage men because um, in Africa it's important to engage men in all um, aspects so we can get a uh, good impact uh, with a uh, good result. Um, here I will talk about our step of transformative learning. Mm, Disorient dilemma through empowerment, uh, have some self-examination through mentoring. You know, I mean, uh, we explain option of new behavior through mentoring and empowerment. We build confidence in new ways through mentoring and empowerment. And, and we empower women and girls to plan a course of action for their social economic development. How uh, we can overcome gender equality challenges uh, by mentoring and empowering women, girls, and raise awareness of men to support women in their journey. We develop contextually mentoring programs for women, girls, based on their cultural context and priorities. And finally, we sensitize on the importance of having local authorities to enforce laws to protect women, girls, through empowerment. So um, uh, we hope that uh, you will help uh, our organization to help young women and girls in Africa in their journey for social economic transformation for a better world. Here is the end of my presentation and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and I think you've highlighted the importance of mentoring, of having reference, mm -hmm. reference, uh, which also came up uh, in the first presentation of uh, with this initiative that had the support of the vice chancellor um, and, and, and her herself as a role model. Um, let's move to our first, uh, our, our next presentation. Uh, Aida Keita Mbo uh, is the president of Energia Mali. Uh, she will be presenting a project to create sustainable resources of income for women to face the effects of climate change. After spending over 20 years working on environmental and sustainable development issues with UNDP in Mali, in 2017, she was appointed Minister of the Environment, Sanitation and Sustainable Development. She's currently the chair of Energia Mali Network, an association whose mission focuses, among other things, on gender and energy. And she's also an esteemed, I should say, member of our SDSN Sahel's executive board. Uh, bonjour, uh, Madame. Um, I, I will ask you to turn on your camera and we can move to your presentation. The floor is yours. Oops, unfortunately, I think you're muted. We we can't hear you. Let's see if our colleagues in the technical side can unmute you. Is it okay now? Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and for Tine, but <laughs> I have to speak in English, but I am really a Francophone uh, person, but uh, I will try to do my best in English. And uh, I'm not very useful with technology. So I have to click on partager l'écran. Is it okay? For the I presentation? I yes, think that, so, that's yeah. correct, Madame Keita. Partager l'écran. Oui. Okay. D'accord. Is it okay now? Hello? Yes, we can see it. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. My presentation, we uh, have six points. The first one is a presentation of Energia Network. 
the second point will be a presentation of the project area. And uh, we will talk about the Kela project and the main activity carries out. And after uh, we will see some outlook and we will have a conclusion. So uh, concerning uh, Energia uh, Network, it's a Malian uh, gender uh, and sustainable energy network organized by uh, some individual and uh, some commitment to remain the gender disparity in access and use sustainable energy service is obtain is um, what we say the accord card in in french it's an an agreement with uh, between ngo and the government of mali and uh, we are member of uh, several other networks, such as uh, Réseau Climat Mali, National Platform on Malian Civil Society Actor on Climate and Environment Sustainable Development, member also of Climate and Development Network, and member of uh, Gender Security and Challenge, Coalition Climate, and so on. Uh, the vision of the Energy Mali is uh, taking it into account the energy sector must contribute to mitigation gender related vulnerabilities. In Mal Energia Mali intend to promote equitable access and control of sustainable energy service for women and men as an essential right to development and it is commitment to achieve SDG 7 and SDG 5. Main mission is to contribute building capacity of women and promote consideration on gender in access to energy and sustainable development. Main goals, uh, I will not read all the goals, to facilitate networks between its member and exchange information between user and energy service provider, promote consideration of the differential need of men and women in energy policy, strengthen capacity of its member and different actor, support communities in development and evaluation of the local program for development, integration of FDGs, FDGs and the consideration of the objective of national uh, determined contribution, monitoring and evaluation and project and so on. Uh, another thing we can note that we promote sanitation and improve living environment policy uh, for population, uh, promotes good uh, self-sufficiency and empowerment of women through income generating activity. Uh, about uh, the project we are talking about now, uh, the project area is uh, less than 100 kilometers from Bamako. You have uh, the city of Kela here, the city of Kela is one of the 11 villages that make up the rural commune of Minijan. It's on the road to Guinea and have 2,000, more than 2,000 inhabitants according to a report uh, 2099. And uh, it is important uh, that we know that uh, Kela project is based on economic empowerment of women from renewable energy project. It is it has been initiated by women of Kela through our NGO and submitted to Simimpu Foundation. It's a flow of concerned women of Kela in order in order to fight 
against climate change and laying a solid foundation for promoting agricultural and market gardening production. This is generating income for their own economy autonomy. Uh, it aims to create sustainable source of income for uh, definitive women empowerment from renewable energy. It aims also to achieve gender equity and power all women and girls and aim to end all form of discrimination and violence against women and girls. So more than 1,000 women are direct beneficiaries, more than 100 uh, men are indirect beneficiaries with 29 people we be, we living with disabilities, with all the entire population to slow down the exode of young toward goal planning, IRA, and illegal immigration on the city. The main activity of uh, the project is uh, we have done installation of solar equipment, uh, freezer, dryer, ice make production making, battery charging, public lighting. Uh, we have done uh, also information on climate climate change and its effects. A strong participation of women and young people during awareness and information session. And uh, we have to note that uh, the women express themselves uh, freely and clearly pos posing the real problem they face on the land. For example, lack of fertile land, technical insufficiencies to carry out resilience activity, scarcity, firewood, lack of source of income. The proposed solution of to all the problems raised during the debates. Commitments we are made by the municipal council, namely the integration of action seated by women in their, their local plan, as well as their participation to its formulation. This is a very important highlight on uh, the project based on KELA. This highlights in the perspective the integration of women in the decision-making process at the village level. And during this process, we note an uh, awakening of awareness among women regarding the degradation of natural resources because they are committed to develop resilience activity in the face of climate change. And uh, one other activity was the production of ice. Uh, you know, Mali is a very uh, cold uh, country. So they have uh, one activity, uh, production and making of uh, ice. So it is uh, to better benefit from the, this activity. Women have set up a management committee within the group whose different members are identified identified with uh, function. Each in its role is organized by linking household activity to the activity of the group within they are not affected in their home work which is very beneficial beneficial to in the daily management of uh, women. A beginning accountability in the programming of activity that women carry out on a daily basis. Another activity was the installation of solar street lights that enabled the development of income generating night activity and improving the living environment uh, activity in the village. Uh, one activity was also installation of a battery charging unit. So the system allowed women and uh, all the village uh, women to obtain financial resources for this activity. 
which benefits to entire village, which thus has a place to recharge his telephone instead of traveling five kilometers uh, to make the recharge of telephone. And uh, one important activity is uh, training install solar equipment for the installation after installation women uh, civic person of the village was uh, trained and uh, three women including the president of the association and uh, three men including a person with, with living with disability was trained for this uh, equipment I finished. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, yes, one I, minute. Thanks. Yes, one minute. But uh, je, I think that uh, conclusion, I will go to conclusion because I have two slides, but the main important is uh, conclusion. But uh, on perspective, just one word to say that uh, we will organize uh, the, the inclusion of the woman to the preparation of the local plan and people, women want to develop a business plan for them. In conclusion, the project was successful in advance over aspect of equity and human rights. <clears throat> we It benefits from a support and accompaniment of all local communities, administrative authority, with constituencies of an achievement of integration of women in the development process. Uh, women and men understand that uh, to fight against ef effect of change my climate change need to join effort. So I think that I will stop here and try to respond to the question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, comprehensive um, presentation, and, and it, it's definitely a, a very holistic type of uh, network, providing a number, addressing a number of challenges uh, that are indeed interconnected. Um, let me pass the floor to our last speaker, uh, who is Olga Iermkova from the SDSM Black Sea Network. Olga is a prof professor, doctor of economics, and head of the Department of Economic and Ecological Development of Seaside Regions. And she's the head of the Council of Young Scientists of the State Organization Institute of Market and Economy and Ecological Researchers of the National Ac Academy of Sciences in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, welcome, Olga. Unfortunately, Olga, we can't hear you. There seems to be a problem with your mic. Mm, no. Mm, no, it doesn't seem to be working. Let's try again. No, it's not working. We can see your screen, but we cannot hear you. And it seems to be something on your computer because we hear something, but not clearly. Olga, please check if your computer is muted. The the button of, uh, yes? We can't we can't quite hear you. So maybe would it be uh, okay for you to uh, reinitiate your computer one second, and and maybe we can pass uh, over to the questions and have you come back. Does that make sense? Let's give that a try. All right. Uh, so let's move to to our Q and A um, with the audience, but we've also invited uh, a, a few um, experts. Um, in particular, Michael Shank and Ines Sanchez de Madariaga. Um, Michael is the director of engagement for the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance and the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Welcome and thank you for joining us uh, one more year, Michael. And Ines is currently the chair at the 
at the advisory group on gender issues at AGGI at UN Habitat, among uh, other responsibilities and positions. Thank you so much, Ines, for joining us too. Um, Michael, um, I see that you're the first one who has turned on your camera. So <laughs> do you want to, <laughs> I'll, I'll put you on the spot. Do you want to ask any questions to our colleagues? Yes, thank you for having me. And I'll just quickly add in chat something I think about all the time in my work with cities, as well as in my teaching at New York University, which is the scaling up of this work in communicating it out to the world, to the public, to the press, to policymakers, et cetera. And so what I was most interested in in reviewing the presentations in advance is how we share these solutions with the world. And Maria knows this well, because we're former colleagues, and this is something I drumbeat all the time. But this is also to the audience out there in terms of taking these good solutions. And part of that scaling up of solution is sharing it with everyone. And why I put these links in chat is because one aspect of gender equality work is making sure that we've got these voices in the press, in all the kinds of press, TV, radio, print, online, etc., so that we're balancing a gender unequal past in the press too. And so I very much wanted to include those links so that it inspires us to better balance the gender inequality of past publishing. And so it's, it's more a, a call to action for all of us, but if any of the panelists want to address this in particular, which is perhaps a, a quick solution in how you've scaled up in the social space, either social media or print media or TV media or radio, et cetera, the, this work so that these solutions can be seen and heard elsewhere. Uh, I also put some links in chat, but I'll stop here uh, to see if anyone has any responses. Thanks, Maria. Thanks so much, Michael. And I think you closed the cycle very well of what Marta kicked us off with. No? Who is doing the research? Who is telling us about the research? Who are we listening to? I don't know if any of our speakers wants to jump in on this question. How do you make your, uh, your solutions known? How do you uh, communicate about them? And how you, do you try to create a space for yourself in this world that is more crowded by men? Anyone wants to jump in? Hi, hi, can you hear me now? Fantastic, Olga, yes, we can. Because I was so waiting on my uh, presentation. In my presentation, I am uh, raising uh, up this uh, question about uh, promotion women through uh, social networks, professional networks. Okay. Uh, and um, and uh, social networks like Facebook, where we present uh, not only our academic, personal academic achievements, but also our uh, personal um, life, like hobbies, uh, travelings, uh, etc. Uh, also, we published a set of um, articles in um, mass media, uh, international mass media, um, representing women research and uh, uh, showing imp their impact in the community development in the region of our region, our city, our country, and international economy as a whole. Um, so uh, publication, uh, um, social media, and participation in uh, networking events. But I hope I will have possibility to make my whole presentation. Great, Olga. So I think you've linked very well to Michael's uh, question. Do you want to do your presentation now? You'll, you would have three minutes, but uh, we, we do want to hear about this because creating that space for ourselves in the public sphere is, is very important. Go ahead, please. So I'm happy to greet you from Odessa, Ukraine. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be present on such a global event. Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm a doctor of economics professor. And beside my uh, scientific uh, professional work, I am also actively involved in the social activities uh, as a head of uh, Council of Young Scientists and the, my of the My Institute. 
here you can see some uh, numbers of uh, the council. Uh, we have 20 members and uh, perfect, at the moment we have perfect gender equality, 10 women, 10 men. And uh, tools for empowering women in science that we use uh, can be grouped uh, in, in three groups, uh, promotion, mentorship, and networking. Uh, before I uh, move uh, to uh, these uh, tools, I would like to say about uh, some numbers uh, about women in science in Ukraine. As you can see, about number of researchers, um, we are close to equality. Men are 54% uh, uh, and uh, women 45% in science. But if we will see about percentage of uh, women involved uh, in the doctors um, title, uh, as doctors of science. Here uh, we see sharp decrease to uh, only 29%. Uh, the same in top management uh, at scientific establishment, not more than 36%. The untaped potential of uh, brilliant women who might be interested in uh, science but choose um, not to pursue degrees and their uh, careers in uh, science um, because of different uh, um, Obst life obstacles uh, represents an important lost opportunity for both for women themselves and for the community, for the uh, society as a whole. So our mission is to attract engaged women into work in science by personal example and networking for further career development. So about uh, tools that we use, promotion through social and professional networks. Uh, we developing our profiles in professional networks like ORCID and Academia Net, uh, that is European database with currently more than 3,000 profiles of highly qualified women in uh, academia. Also, we're developing our profiles in social networks like Facebook, where to present not only, pers not only personal academic achievements, but also other aspects of life, life hobby, traveling, etc. So uh, this uh, help us to inspire each other, to help to create an identity and to develop our message and, uh, pu and public presence. Uh, next uh, instrument promotion in mass media, as I told, um, we organized publishing of the series of articles that present and popularize the research of young women scientists of our institute and their impact on the social, economic, ecological development of the city and the Odessa region, Ukraine and international economy. It is an international journal, the Odessa uh, Journal. It helps to raise awareness uh, of the research of women scientists and their impact on the community development. Also, we organize uh, meetings uh, of experienced women scientists with school girls and young women scientists at the beginning of their career. Such meetings are aimed at um, provoking the young's interest in science and their desire to pursue career in science by demonstrating real examples of successful career and opportunities that working in science gives to women. Next uh, group of uh, tools, it is a mentorship providing mentorship to the young women scientists at the beginning of their career by experienced uh, women scientists in a research, in a project implementation, in a career development. And we have uh, successful stories about this. So it helps to transfer experience among experienced uh, women scientists and younger colleagues to provide them with advice and professional support. And finally, the last group of uh, tools, uh, networking instruments, organizing networking events at different levels and with different communities, uh, scientific community, a business community, we collaborate with club of young business women in our city and informal collaboration that it is also important, not only professional collaboration, informal collaborations through participation in cultural events, exhibition of creative uh, hobbies, dancing classes, trips. It helps to strengthen collaboration among uh, women scientists that leads to increase of uh, joint scientific projects, uh, publications, scientific 
events, research at the local, national and international level. So the mission of our community of women science uh, scientists is not only to attract uh, engaged women uh, into science, but also to support them in the development of their scientific career, um, considering work-life balance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Olga. And again, your solution was perhaps uh, even better listened to after Michael's question because it addressed some of uh, some of his uh, some of his comments. Um, I think there's one question, uh, Marta uh, Bekele. I believe that you also have a question for the panelists. If everyone is able to stay just five more minutes, we can we can address these. Marta, I'm happy to give you the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, one of the comments that I have is for Andres. Uh, in your statement, you said women are not natural decision makers. I'm hoping that this is uh, an issue of language translation because we see women making decisions every day as as uh, small scale farmers, as you know, playing a bigger role in um, the home care economy. Uh, another comment that I have for one of the panelists, uh, Aseato, is that great presentation, uh, like everyone else, um, involving men. I, I really liked that. I hope, I, I wish that the how was explained more, but maybe because of time. But we know that uh, if there is anything this feminist movement of ours has taught us, it is including everyone and not li leaving anyone, boys and men, because it may lead. And we've seen it in major towns, at least, uh, leading to double uh, responsibilities of women in the boardroom as well as at home with chores. And finally, uh, with uh, intervention Michael uh, made, I really liked that. Uh, the only comment that I had was instead of saying, why are opaids still mostly written by men? We should have at least, you know, why are opaids still mostly published by men? Because we don't know who is writing those opaids. Thank you. Yes, and Michael, I think you had already reacted in the question and answer, agreeing with that part. Um, but this question of engaging the whole community and going beyond the beneficiaries of the project uh, is something that also came up in the chat. I don't know if anyone wants to respond to that point. How do we engage families that are of the beneficiaries who are uh, being a part of these projects? How do we engage the communities to make sure that these uh, changes have the support? Any of, of our of our panelists wants to take these questions? Okay. I don't see anyone jumping at this question. Aida, do you want to? Yes. Uh, but I think that there was a question about uh... Uh, communication, how to communicate uh, about uh, all the result of project and so on. I think that we have a lot of mechanism, but uh, in our uh, case, we have Facebook of Inertia. We have also a member of a number uh, some networks. So we, we will have uh, to, to create a, a kind of uh, network on this specific case and uh, share it with uh, all the members. We have also, uh, we can write it in the, the press document. And uh, we have also to, to organize the kind of conference of, on what uh, the project is doing for uh, contributing to SDG 5 and 7. So we, we, we have planned uh, this uh, be, before the COP2028. Thank you so much, Madam Keita. Um, and of course, SDG 17 is very dear to SDSN's heart, given that we are, after all, a big network, and we think that we need to uh, work in, in partnerships. Anyone else wants to share some final thoughts? or else I think it's time for us to close our, our event. I want to thank our partners in this event once again. So that would be GIZ and BMZ. I want to thank our panelists for their work and for 
working with us over the last few months mm -hmm. when we were selecting the solutions and then on these Hello. presentations. And once again, Michael, thank you so much for joining us, for your insights. And Marta, thank you so much once again for uh, giving us those very insightful uh, uh, opening remarks. And to everyone else, uh, ICSD is only starting today. So please uh, share, uh, make sure to go to our website to see all of the events uh, that will be happening in the next few uh, days. And uh, we hope to see you there in the coming days. Have a good rest of the week. Bye.